when you are comfortably seated, please find in your Bibles Jeremiah chapter 7 tonight. Jeremiah and chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible, we have plenty of those available throughout the room under the chairs. They would be the black, the black books. If you see somebody that needs a Bible, feel free to get them one. By the way, speaking of Bibles, in Sunday school this morning, 100% of the teenagers brought their Bibles. 100% of them brought their Bibles to Sunday school this morning. And, uh, you know, we talked about a couple weeks ago the importance of having your Bible with you everywhere you go. And guess what? We even used them in Sunday school class. It really <laughs> was fantastic. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's a good example. And I would urge you not to buy into current trends too much. I understand using technology in a positive way, but there's just something about having the Word of God and having a book that you can, uh, don't take this the wrong way, but a book that you can mark up and use, use hard, and just, just always have that book that's readily open. There's something about knowing where it's at in your Bible, just opening your Bible and writing cross-references and study, and then when you read that same portion of Scripture, remembering those times that you met with God. And uh, I don't know about you, but my Bible's become my friend. It's really uh, annoying for my wife, because right now I've got three Bibles. <laughs> that, that You can't just retire a Bible. you kind of got to phase in a new one. Yeah, when you when you have uh, different things written in your Bible and notes and so forth, and you, you get ready to uh, try to break in a new Bible. I've been trying to use this one for several months now, but I've still got my middle Bible, the in-between, the one that I was really using that wore out too quickly, and then this one. And uh, But I recommend for you, get a, get a copy of the Scripture. And, and it is so vitally important, you know, that you have the Word of God around you. I recognize you can put an app on your smartphone, but I'll tell you what else you can do on your smartphone. You can be looking at it and have something pop up and distract you <laughs> like crazy. And so... Uh, I recommend have, have a copy of the Scripture. But our teens all had their Bibles in Sunday school class this morning, so we're going to go to Cece's Pizza tonight uh, afterward. So uh, that's, uh, that's for the teens that were in Sunday school and had their Bibles there. All right, did you find Jeremiah chapter 7? Okay, look down, if you will, with me. And let's just begin in verse 1. And uh, we'll read the first, the first uh, three verses. No, four verses. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Well, Father, I pray that this evening you would help us to understand what your indictment of your people was and that you would help us to identify the same attitudes or spirits in ourselves. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today is, today is the day that we celebrate Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. We call it Palm Sunday. And you say, well, Pastor, what connection does Jeremiah chapter 7 have with Palm Sunday? Well, actually, it has a pretty significant connection. If, uh, and, it's, and it's not mysterious. I'm not going to you know, preach a long sermon and reveal at the very end the connection uh, to you. I, if you haven't made it already, I'll just review with you and ask you a couple questions, and hopefully you'll be right there. Okay, you remember what Jesus did when he entered into Jerusalem. It was prophesied, of course, that he would enter in the, into Jerusalem as a meek and lowly king riding on, an, an, on a colt or on an, on an ass in the colt of an ass or the foal of an ass. And so he was prophesied that this is how he would make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And I don't know about you, but it, it's just so fitting, it's so typical of how Jesus does things to tell a couple of his disciples you know, go over to this city by Bethphage and, and uh, go into the city and, and loose the colt or loose the ass. And when they ask you why you're doing it, then just tell them the master has need of them and they'll say, oh, okay, fine. 
and that will, you know, that will suffice. Well, well, Pastor, is it possible that Jesus had some prearrangements with these folks? Uh, did Jesus need to? <laughs> the answer is not really. I mean, it's prophesied that this is what he'd do. And for an individual that told his disciples, if you're going to follow me, and where I lodge, you're going to lodge. Where, you, where I dwell, you're going to dwell. And when I tell you that the foxes have their holes and the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Jesus didn't have possessions, and he wasn't going to go out and buy one. And it's just so fitting, isn't it, that even the donkey that he rode into Jerusalem on was alone. It's just interesting. It's just very, very fitting. And there's a lot of significance to that. But Jesus went into Jerusalem. The people uh, strawed down the way before him. They put down their garments and they put down branches, which was to signify that a king shouldn't have his, uh, shouldn't touch the ground or his, uh, it should have a way that's made for him, that's, that's clean and that's prepared for him. And as he went up in Jerusalem, they cried, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. And they uh, proclaimed him as a king. When he got into Jerusalem, they asked the question, or the, they asked the multitude the question, who is this? And they said, this is Jesus. He's a prophet uh, from Nazareth. I missed several calls before the service, and I turned my volume on just a little bit, and now it does that to me. Uh, sorry about that. And so Jesus is, or the, the multitudes told the dwellers at Jerusalem who Jesus was. Then the question is, that ties into our text this evening, what did Jesus do when he got there? When the temple, what did he do? What? He threw out the money channel. He cleaned house. And he said, what? It's written that my house should be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And so he went, quote, to the one place on earth where he had a legitimate home, actually, the temple. If you were to ask, where does Jesus belong, the Son of God? Where does he belong on earth? Well, in the day that Jesus Christ came as the King of the Jews, he belonged in the temple because he was God. And that's where God's presence dwelt with men. So you ask the question, Pastor, what does, what does Jeremiah 7 have to do with Matthew 21 or the passage in Mark or in Luke? Well, we're going to look at that this evening and just look at a couple of simple truths and that reflect who Jesus is and what God wanted. First of all, God told Jeremiah, stand in the gate, we're in verse 2, of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. So, we see the audience to whom Jeremiah is to prophesy, and the audience would be individuals that are going in the temple, and the Bible gives the purpose. Why are they going into the temple? To worship the Lord. Right? Okay, so this would be the cream of the crop, would it not? This would be the individuals that would worship God uh, the way that Jesus put it to the woman at the well. Remember what she said? She said, you know, the Jews say that we, should, we have to worship in Jerusalem, uh, but, you know, we worship here in this mountain. They have a high place in the mountain, and uh, we believe we can worship here. And Jesus said, God is a spirit. So God can be worshipped anywhere, but He said they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the true place of worship for God was where? It was the temple. So that's why the high places were illegitimate. If you study and you look at high places, one of the most confusing studies at first that you'll ever have because a high place was a good place. Oftentimes a high place was a place where an individual met God. And where God did something. God could meet someone anywhere, couldn't He? God transcends the temple. But the appropriate place for a man to meet God was the temple. That was God's plan. And it, it, uh, if, if we were in the same dispensation, it would be God's plan today. If you have a Jewish friend who is willing to consider facts and truth, ask them a simple question. 
two questions that, that are really good questions and ask them to think about it not go ask their rabbi how to get around the question okay but ask them a question first of all ask them about the priesthood levitical listen if you believe that god is the god of that god, that jesus isn't god and that the messiah is not come then you certainly believe in temple worship don't you and two questions where is your temple and where are your priests and sacrifices? Because in the system of Judaism, which today is paganism, in the system today, there is no means for an individual to find forgiveness from God or to offer sacrifice for sins. There is no economy in Judaism today to deal with sin and the separation that it causes between man and God. Where are the sacrifices? Where, are your t where is your temple? And that is a significant question, isn't it? Okay? Uh, there was an attitude by these individuals that entered into worship God, though. See, I look at this and I say, okay, if I'm going to read what the Scripture says, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord, I'm going to say that's, that's the good group, right? That's the good crowd. Because there would have been people that didn't worship at the temple. But here's what God said to them. He said, amend your ways and your doings, and I'll cause you to dwell in this place. Now, this place would signify both the temple as well as Jeru Judah and Jerusalem. And then he went on to qualify by saying, trust not in lying words, saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Now, I don't know about you, but it took me a little bit of studying to understand what is meant by repeating the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord are these. Well, if you just study the possessive or the possession, here you see that this temple belongs to the Lord, but actually what is implied is that the Lord belongs to the temple. See, in Israel, particularly in Judah, there wasn't actually a debate about who God is. There wasn't a debate about does God exist, is God real? That wasn't the debate. It wasn't a matter of is Baal really God or is the Lord God? Uh, you say, Pastor, why would worship of Baal or any other God appeal to somebody who had the true living God? That's a good question, isn't it? Well, you study Baal worship, it appealed to the flesh. It was a fleshly worship. It was a worship that ultimately uh, did what is described in Romans chapter 1, which is that it created a God who is actually inferior to yourself and made it so that you serve your flesh when you worship it. And there's a lot of, there was a, a lot of cultural um, just wickedness that went with Baal worship. And that was the attraction for it. The very people that were worshiping in the temple of the Lord were also worshiping Baal. That's what we see from our text. Let's look down at verse, verse 8. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal and murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom you know not? And come and stand before me in this house, this is verse 10, which is called by my name and say we are delivered to do all these abominations. See, the same individuals that came to the temple to worship the Lord were the same individuals that were doing, committing abominations and worshiping Baal and saying, God gave us the deliverance. God gave us the freedom to do this. By the way, doesn't that sound like what is called Christian liberty today? Isn't it just about exactly the same thing? Listen, the, the whole matter of alcohol, drinking alcohol, the whole matter of uh, fornication, the matters that Christians, quote, take as license or liberties because of being set free from the very same is the same notion that, that uh, the temple worshipers had back then. But what is meant by the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord? Exactly this. We read it and we think that means that this temple belongs to God. Well, that's kind of what they were expressing. That is sort of what they are saying. 
So what they're saying is, this is the Lord's temple. As Jeremiah is prophesying destruction, and as he is prophesying captivity, both for Israel and for Judah, the people's response was, well, you have to think about where God lives. I mean, is God really going to let the enemy come into Jerusalem and trash the temple? Because that's where he is. See, if the temple is destroyed, then God's name is blasphemed, right? And their argument, essentially, was a very, very simple one. Their argument was, because God's in the temple, He can't let anyone touch the temple. Right? And if He can't allow anyone to touch the temple, then basically we have God in a box. God's stuck in Jerusalem. He's stuck in the temple. And He can't get out. Because if He leaves, He'll look bad. And they literally are using God's name as though He is a hostage. God will make you look bad if you don't allow us to do abominations. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. These, the temple of the Lord are these. This is, this is God's. This belongs to God. And God is not going to let something happen to His temple. You can go there today and see that they were mistaken. Matter of fact, they found out right away they were mistaken. Well, Pastor, we're not in the culture of Judaism. This is the church and it's a distinct dispensation and God has a future plan for Israel and future plan for His temple and all those things. And so what does this have to do with us? I think sometimes we as believers think that somehow God is our hostage. That if God were to bring judgment on us, the embarrassment would harm His testimony. And do you know who believes that? We do. But you know who doesn't believe that? God doesn't. You see, I read this, and I read the notion that these individuals have, and I think of the glorious temple that was destroyed, and I don't think badly of God at all, do you? I don't think, what a waste. All that investment, all that gold, all that craftsmanship, all the wisdom God gave those men to build that temple and just tear it down and let it be taken into captivity. What a tragedy for the testimony of God. No, what a tragedy that a people who had actually known deliverance lived in such bondage. And friend, God doesn't buy into the whole you're a hostage Mentality. God, I'm your representative, so if I look bad, you look bad. By the way, God never looks bad. And a lot of individuals want to talk about God as though He looks bad, but they're always covering up their own. They're always covering up their own bad look, if you will. Isn't it true? I've had people say, "Man, the the church, the Christians, those people, they're so pathetic." They're so wicked. They do the same things that I do. As though somehow that reflects on a holy, sinless God. It doesn't. See, my friend, God's never been at fault. God's never failed. And when His people fail, listen to me now, it's because of rebellion. Not because something's wrong with God. You know, we do it in relationships. A lot of times in relationships, husbands and wives hold themselves, hold each other, one another hostage. And, you know, if we get help for this problem we have in our marriage, we'll both look bad. You want us both to look bad? You know, Christians do that with God all the time. Do you know if this were known, if this were known about me, then I've seen kids do this. 
if people knew what I do, they'd know you're not good parents about the parents, and you'll look bad. So keep it all hush. Keep it all mom. And my friend, God will never look bad because He's perfect and He's sinless. And you can argue a case against God, but my friend, it'll be false accusations that you'll make and they won't stand, they won't stick. God asks His people many times, bring your accusations. What have I done to you? What are your accusations? You know, my friend, any accusation against God is a false accusation. It's true, isn't it? You don't have an accusation against God. I've heard some Christians mistakenly think you know, that there are things they could accuse God of. I heard someone uh, say, I heard a couple of people in, in the last couple of months mention that their accusation against God is that He would send people to an eternal hell. And they just have a hard time dealing with that. Hard time comprehending that. My friend, that isn't complicated. That's not a difficult question to answer. The wicked deserve to be turned into hell. God cannot overlook the sin of the wicked and be a holy God. There's nothing wrong with God for judging the wicked. There's something wrong with the wicked for sinning against God. But it's so innate in us, it's so characteristic of us to try to twist things and turn them. People have problems a lot of the times they ask, why is God doing this to me? How did I get here? You know, and, and they act as though they never did anything wrong. Sometimes when people say that to me, I don't feel that I have to defend God because He's, he's pretty solid. He's, he's, he's innocent and He's got a pretty good case. But sometimes I just have to remind people, well, here's how you got here. Step one, step two, step three. This is wrong, this is wrong, and this is wrong. And that's pretty easy for me to do looking at someone else. And honestly, <laughs> it isn't so hard for me to do looking at myself. Why does God allow you? What do you mean by that, Pastor? I mean, why does God allow you? If you think it's because He's hostage, because He'll look bad if you look bad, you've overlooked the reason. Let's ask the question again. Why does God allow you? Why does God allow you to do what you do and not destroy you? Because it's in His character to be merciful and long-suffering. And His mercy and His long-suffering, my friend, make Him altogether lovely. They don't make Him look bad. You can't have it both ways. You can't play it on both sides. You can't say, God, if you were good, or God, if you were good. A lot of people try to play that game, don't they? God, if you were good, you wouldn't allow evil. Or God, if you were good, you wouldn't judge evil. Same people, same game. Speaking out of both sides of their mouth, the fact of the matter is that God is long-suffering. The reason God allows some things is because He's merciful. And I'll remind you of what Jeremiah was told in the opening of this indictment against Judah and against the temple. He told Israel, amend your ways. Amend your ways, verse 3, and your doings, and I'll cause you to dwell in this place. Now here's where we want to get to this evening. In a very short time, Jesus finished the business of the temple in Jerusalem after He went in and cleansed it, didn't He? It wasn't very long until the veil in that Holy of Holies was ripped in half, signifying that God was not there.
There always is, even for a believer, there's always a point. There's always a place when you cross this place, and I don't know where it is. I don't want to find out where it is, but there's always a place when you go this far, you went too far. And until you come to that point, God's message for you is amend your ways. Go in the wrong direction. Turn it around. And that's a reflection of His character. God had told Jeremiah, this is coming. Tell the people, this is what's going to happen. And tell them, turn around. Amend your ways. Stop saying this. Stop doing this. I did not set you free so you could live in bondage. You know the message is characteristic of God and it's true today. God did not set you free so you could live in bondage. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Oh friend, Watch what you say. Watch what you do. Because you're standing in the place of mercy. But you'll come to the place of judgment and destruction. Because of the holy character of God. What did Jesus do when He went into the temple? He cleaned it up. Let me ask you a question finalizing our message this evening. Where is the temple of the Lord today? Right here. Right here. Temple of the Lord. Temple of the Lord. Don't say it again. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple? The Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit. Is that right? And the Holy Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Therefore glorify God in your body and your soul, which are God's. Why did Jesus cleanse the temple? Well, because it was His place. It belonged to Him. He didn't want the garbage in there. And you're the temple of the Lord. And I think that the day that we reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus made when He went to Jerusalem to die is a day that we ought to remember that we're purchased with the price. And that the temple because Jesus went there to die. Jesus died for this place. That it ought to be a clean place. It shouldn't be full of wickedness and idolatry and filthiness. It ought to be a clean place. What kind of a temple are you? What kind of a temple are you? No, it's not a profound message. But I see a pretty strong connection between Jeremiah 7 and Jesus' actions when he went into the temple and cleaned the house. I see a correlation in the church between believers who are on the precipice of disaster and they're daring God, saying, God, if it's wrong, why don't you do something about it? God, if you do something about it, it's going to make you look bad. If they find out what I'm doing, it's going to destroy your testimony, better look out. Because God's testimony cannot be destroyed. If the temple needs to be cleansed, it's God who will cleanse it, not God who is causing the need for cleansing. Father, I pray that You would impress us with the simplicity of the truth that the temple ought to be clean. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for your attention this evening. You're dismissed.